This is the last in the series of videos covering immunologic disease states or autoimmune diseases. The last autoimmune condition we will talk about is psoriasis. Psoriasis is a chronic inflammatory skin disease that is characterized by thickened red scaly plaques. Psoriasis is another example of an autoimmune disease state. In terms of autoimmune diseases, psoriasis is the second most common after rheumatoid arthritis. Its prevalence in the United States is estimated to be as high as 3%. Its peak age range of diagnosis is prior to age 40. Over 75% of patients are diagnosed before this age. One of the clinical presentations of psoriasis is psoriatic arthritis. In terms of arthritis, psoriatic arthritis is one of the less common types after osteoarthritis, gout, rheumatoid arthritis, and polymyalgia. In general, psoriasis is more common in Caucasians than in other ethnic groups. As you can see, the highest psoriasis Cis prevalence is seen in North America, South America, Europe, and Australia. There are both genetic and environmental factors that play a role in the development of psoriasis. In terms of genetics, psoriasis, like other autoimmune conditions, runs in families. There's estimated to be between 36 and 91% heritability of psoriasis and multiple gene loci are involved, making it a multifactorial genetic disorder. Some of those genetic loci include the HLA genes, the TNF alpha gene, and the gene that encodes interleukin 23 or IL 23. There is also very high concordance in twin studies, upwards of 80%, again, illustrating the genetic linkage of psoriasis. There are several environmental factors that can act as either predisposing factors for the development of psoriasis in the first place, or as triggers of a psoriasis exacerbation. Like most autoimmune conditions, psoriasis is characterized by relapses and remissions, and the triggers listed here are known to result in a relapse of the disease. These triggers and thing, include things like injuries, for example, cuts, burns, or insect bites, certain infections, especially streptococcus-mediated upper respiratory infections, the presence of dry air or having dry skin. The use of certain drugs can trigger psoriasis, including antimalarials, beta blockers, lithium, or NSAIDs. Stress can certainly trigger a relapse. Uh, sun exposure is interesting where actually too little sun exposure can be detrimental as well as too much sun exposure. So there appears to be a sweet spot where exposure to UV light and most likely due to the conversion of vitamin D is beneficial, but too much or too little can trigger a relapse. Finally, Smoking and drinking alcohol can predispose or trigger a relapse of psoriasis. Psoriasis is a type four hypersensitivity condition. I'll go into more detail about type four hypersensitivity here, but I originally introduced it in the context of rheumatoid arthritis. If you have not yet watched the RA video, you may want to go back and review that first. In type four hypersensitivity, there are two responses to note. The first shown on the left is the precipitation of the response. The second shown on the right is the presentation or the expression of the immune response. So a type four hypersensitivity disease requires an initial sensitization or precipitation followed by a subsequent expression of the disease. In the sensitization step, an antigen, labeled in this figure as a haptin, triggers an abnormal immune response when it activates dermal dendritic cells to present the antigen to T cells. This results in the activation 
of certain T cell subtypes, primarily the Th1 subtype. These Th1 cells then release various cytokines, including TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and interleukin-1. Those Th1 cells are now activated to respond to the antigen should it be encountered again in the future. In the expression of the response, shown on the right, the antigen again interacts with a dendritic cell. Upon presentation to T cells, these T cells then infiltrate into the skin where they release various cytokines, including TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and IL-1, that all result in an inflammatory response that causes damaging lesions on the surface of the skin. In psoriasis, this process can also happen in the joints, which is what leads to psoriatic arthritis, a condition that is similar in many ways to rheumatoid arthritis, though the underlying antigen response is different. In the case of psoriasis, the inflammatory response trigger, triggers several reactions in the skin that result in the characteristic lesions of psoriasis. The first thing that happens is that keratinocytes, which are skin cells, begin to proliferate. This is a process known as epidermal hyperplasia. Normally, the epidermis is the narrowest layer of the skin, but in individuals with psoriasis, because of epidermal hyperplasia and keratinocyte activation, epidermal growth is anywhere from two to 10 times faster than normal, and the epidermis layer of the skin grows significantly thicker. This thickened epidermis results in the formation of plaques on the surface of the skin, and these will be shown on a subsequent slide. In addition, the T cell response results in increased vascularization of the growing epidermis, and this is what causes the erythema or redness of the plaques on the surface of the skin. As I mentioned earlier, like other autoimmune conditions, psoriasis is characterized by a relapsing and remitting course. The most common presentation is plaque psoriasis, as shown in the images here. Over 90% of patients with psoriasis will exhibit plaque psoriasis. These are arithmetous or red plaques, usually larger than 0.5 centimeters in diameter and typically confined to a single location. For example, the knee, the elbow, or the back of the neck. They also can be found over a wide body surface area and be associated with itching as demonstrated in the lower image. These plaques are exacerbated by cer certain drugs, such as the ones I mentioned previously, stress, and also changes in the weather. Other presentations of psoriasis include psoriatic arthritis, which results in joint pain. About 5 to 50% of individuals with psoriasis have joint pain. Individuals may also notice things like severe dandruff and flaking of the scalp, as well as nail changes. Diagnosis of psoriasis involves a physical exam to look for the characteristic lesions of psoriasis. In the case of joint pain, an x-ray may be warranted to determine whether an inflammatory reaction is occurring in the joint space. Assessing a patient with psoriasis primarily involves determining symptom severity using one of two primary scales. The first is the Psoriasis Area Severity Index, or PASI, calculator. A screenshot of an example calculator is shown on the screen. You can see that this looks at the percent involvement of various areas of the body, such as the head, arms, trunk, and legs, whether or not erythema is present, and how strong, how thick, and how scaly the plaques appear. A combination of all of these go into score and will help determine the severity of psoriasis. Another method is to use the body surface area or BSA method. In this case, mild psoriasis is considered less than 3% of the body, moderate is 3 to 10, and severe is more than 10%. Just by way of reference, a 1% surface area is about the surface area found on the hand. 
Psoriasis is a lifelong condition, but can be well controlled with treatment. Unfortunately, there are some comorbidities that commonly occur in individuals with psoriasis, and these include metabolic syndrome, Crohn's disease, and multiple sclerosis. There is also an increased risk of cardiovascular dysfunction and heart disease in individuals with psoriasis. Therefore, one of the important monitoring parameters is heart and vascular function over time. 